So let me start us off in prayer and we'll get started. Lord God, we thank you for who you are, Lord. You are the creator of heaven. All authority over heaven and earth belong to you. And so tonight as we open our hearts to consider the grandeur of heaven, to consider the vastness of it, to consider our place in heaven where you are preparing a room for us, Lord, we, our soul delights in this idea, Lord. I pray that, that you would just open our hearts and, and just fill us with joy to the fact that you are making a place and you are coming back to take us with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, let's start with our map today. Pretty standard map. We're just going to head over to Jerusalem. And basically, we're in a period of time right now, which is the last 24 hours leading up to the cross. And so we're going to spend really the rest of the year with that same map. All right. So let me start us off in the year 1992. There was a Canadian sculptor whose name was Bill Lishman. And he was walking around in his property one day when he noticed that there was a nest of 18 unattended goose eggs. After observing the nest for a little while, it became clear that the nest had been abandoned and that the nearby predators were starting to take notice. So feeling inspired to rescue these eggs, Bill made a makeshift incubator in his home. He kept the eggs warm, and then he watched over them until each one of them hatched. But when they eventually emerged from their shells, Bill wasn't prepared for what would happen next. One by one, the geese would look up at Bill the first creature they'd ever witnessed. And they decided right then and there that this strangely unbird-like being would become their father. So that day, Bill became known to his friends and family as Father Goose. <laughs> so he, he named each one of these geese. He fed each one of them. He got to know their personalities. He protected them. He trained them to walk. And eventually, he taught them to run, as you can see in this picture, by running ahead of them through the fields of his backyard. At first, he really loved this job of raising these tiny little geese. But after a while, Father Goose realized that he, he was doing these geese a great disservice because there were so many essential skills he had no way of teaching a goose. Geese are supposed to fly. Geese are supposed to migrate south for the winter. Geese should forage food in their own special way and protect themselves from predators in a way that only a real mother goose can teach. But he looked at these young little hatchlings being fed store-bought grains by hand, living inside a barn, walking when they should be preparing to fly, and it became clear that geese don't belong in this kind of environment. This is not what nature intended. So I wonder if something about this story resonates with you in a personal way. Do you ever get a sense that like these geese being born into a human family, that we are born as spiritual immigrants? We are born into a strange, unfamiliar, alien world. You may not realize it, but you've grown so accustomed to it at this point. But we were raised up waddling through the dirt of depravity and shame when we were actually meant to soar through the sky. Our hearts have this craving within for love and joy and peace, but we've had to settle in this world for violence, hatred, and contempt. God did not create us to know murder, sex trafficking, school shootings, gender confusion, hatred, hypocrisy, genocide. But the home that we live in, this place we call the world, calls those things normal. Like these geese, there is a sense that we were supposed to live in our natural environment, and we are currently not doing that. Instead of following our heavenly Father, this world has convinced us to follow imposters, running through the fields of our lives, trying to learn how to fly from strangers who have no idea how to teach us. Is it just me, or do you have a very real sense that something is not quite right about the world we live in? Is it possible that you were meant to live someplace else? Well, many of us would admit that there's a longing in our soul for something perfect, something peaceful, 
something overflowing with joy and steeped in truth. You know, C.S. Lewis once said, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Do you feel like you are made for another world? If you would say yes, then, then maybe you've asked yourself this question before. Where do you really belong? If it isn't here, then where is it? It's a question that we all have to answer. Because when we look at the Bible, we find that in the beginning, God put mankind on this earth in the Garden of Eden. And when God put us here, that was our natural habitat. It was paradise where we had perfect fellowship with God and we had peace with nature. But from the moment that our sin cursed God's creation, the paradise that we were made for turned into a cesspool that we are currently sinking in. So today you turn on the news and you see evil being called good. You see good being called evil. We live in a world where human beings attempt to convince themselves that they're actually cats and dogs. We are glued to our screens and our devices and slowly spiraling into a world that is built on chaos. Well, the Apostle Paul actually was equally frustrated with the world and what it has to offer. He wrote this, It is a place without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So in, in my search for where I belong, I struggle to believe that this place is what God made me for. And like me, maybe you've longed for something better. Some place where you can feel whole and complete and be at home in the presence of your creator. It's a place where your heart and soul truly feel a sense of belonging. And if we see how poorly this world fits us, how much more does God see our need to come home? So just like our Heavenly Father, Bill Lishman understood all too well that geese do not belong grounded in a barn. They were meant to fly, they were meant to fellowship with other geese, and they were meant to migrate with their flock. So as Bill felt a, a sense of frustration, he looked at his metalworking shop and he had an idea. He decided to build a small lightweight plane and teach the geese how to fly home. So after lots of training, Bill succeeded in teaching the geese how to take flight and to follow him into the sky. But there was still another problem. They didn't know the way home because they had never been home before. It was clear that Father Goose would actually have to show them the way home by flying in front of them the whole distance. But before showing them the way home, first he had to figure out where home should be. So after some phone calls to bird sanctuaries, Bill eventually found one in Virginia that was a perfect fit. He arranged for the sanctuary to prepare a place for his geese where they could roam and nest and build community and live the life that geese are meant to live. So with this plan in place, as fall approached, Bill began taking them home from Canada and flying south a few hours at a time so they could rest. He went over lakes and farmland, and at the end of their journey, the geese found their home. It was a place that they had never known how much they longed for. Will you ever find the home that you're longing for? Well, in our passage this week in John 13 and 14, Jesus makes a bold claim. He tells us that he knows where we belong, and he alone can take us there. And he is preparing it now. So as students of the Bible and followers of Christ, we desperately need answers to know where do we really belong. So let's look at two aspects of this important passage. First of all, what preparations has Jesus made for our rightful home? And then second of all, how will we find the way home when we've never been there? So I want to start off by welcoming you home. This is a, a picture that I came up with that could be kind of what it looks like, but you know, it seems vaguely familiar, and some of Scripture has kind of informed what this picture comes up with. But the Bible instructs us that life in this place, in this home, is entirely different than anything that you've ever known. This place is the reason why our hearts can't seem to get comfortable 
in the inadequacy of the present world we live in. I have a sense that even though this image is very beautiful, I imagine it does not do justice at all to the actual place that God has made for us, which is infinitely more glorious to look at and experience. Ironically, our passage begins uncovering the beauty of heaven in a moment that perfectly illustrates the ugliness of our world. Judas is sneaking out in the night to betray his Lord after the Last Supper. And we start in verse 31, which says, When Judas was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. This is devastating news. Just as we're beginning to warm up to the idea of living in this glorious utopian paradise, Jesus starts off by saying, it's off limits to you. But just a few verses later, Jesus explains why. He says that our paradise is still under construction. And he merely plans to go prepare a place so we can join him there later. So the concept of building up heaven, that sounds like a weird idea, doesn't it, at first? But to a group of disciples who are come from the area of Galilee in the northern Israel, there was something familiar about Jesus' words. As he described going away and preparing a place in his father's house, it sounded a lot like how Galileans got married in the first century of Israel. You see, Galilean marriages, they started off with a betrothal, a promise to get married. And after a small village ceremony, they exchange vows and the future bride and the future groom go their separate ways for a period of time. As the bride is by herself, she would prepare herself with her bridesmaids at home. But the groom, he would go away to the father's house to prepare a new home. And so the idea was the, this process would take maybe even an entire year and during this time, the groom was tasked with constructing a room on the side of his father's house. For the newlyweds, they would live in this house once they got married. So the construction project could not be considered complete until the father of the groom gave his approval. Therefore, neither the groom nor the bride would know the, in advance what their wedding day would be. Only the father knew the time. So as he continued to construct, the, the bride would prepare herself patiently back at home for his uncertain and sudden return, which could even happen in the middle of the night. And when the, the father finally approved the new addition to the home, the groom was free to go and get his bride. So all of this to say that as Christ went to his father's house in heaven to prepare a room, we're reminded that Christ's beloved believers are referred to as his bride in scripture. If you open up Revelation chapter 20, at the second coming of Christ, listen closely to the details that it says about Jesus' return. It says, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, it shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. So today we live in the gap of time in history where Christ says, where I'm going, you cannot come. But someday when Christ returns to his bride, we will enjoy the long-awaited fellowship with God in the Bible known as the marriage supper of the Lamb. So like the bride, Jesus tells us with this illustration that our part as the bride, the church, is to wait for him patiently, prepare ourselves for the sudden unexpected return of the groom. So like the groom, Galilean men would build their house with wood and nails, and Christ's plan is to build our eternal home with the wood and nails of the cross. And in order for the Father to approve of what's being built, the cross of Christ must add the necessary glory to the Father's house. So in verse 31, Jesus shows us how an old rugged cross can amass a glorious stockpile of building material for his Father's house. 
He says, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. You see, the cross is an instrument of glory because all who look to it see the power of God on display. The cross signifies God's victory over death and establishes him alone as the righteous king of justice and the almighty Lord of love. Hebrews chapter 2 says, Jesus is crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone, bringing many sons and daughters to glory. See, our earthly cities, when you go outside and drive home tonight, our earthly cities and kingdoms settle for building with steel and glass and concrete and brick. But our heavenly home will be built with glory. Revelation 21 explains the glory emanating from our heavenly home. It says this, The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. So as Jesus prepares our rooms in his Father's house with each brick of glory, the kingdom of heaven becomes even taller and wider as he builds. So the disciples likely understood this marriage illustration. Like I said, these are very common terms for them. But there's one element that it was still steeped in mystery. They kept wondering, where, where is the Father's house? In verse 36, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. You know, like you and I, we desire the directions to go home right this minute. We inherently know that the glory of heaven is so much better than the brokenness of the world we live in. And we believe ourselves ready to move in today. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. And like Peter, we believe ourselves to be all in for the mission. We're ready to give up whatever is necessary. What about you? Do you consider yourself ready to lay down your life for Jesus right now? I think in our best moments, maybe some of us would emphatically say, yes, heaven, that glorious picture I showed you, heaven is worth the cost. But like Peter, we are prone to overestimate our zeal for God. In verse 38, Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So for Peter and for many of us, Jesus knows the true depth of our faith. And he sees that we are very much in need of a reality check when it comes to our spiritual maturity. Consider this thought. What if God isn't done shaping you into a citizen of heaven? Many of us are, are guilty of looking at to heaven and we see maybe the best golf courses in the universe. Maybe it's the chance to finally have the sports car that you've always wanted. Maybe it's the mansion that you've always dreamed of living in. Is this how you view heaven? Our fantasies about heaven are sadly void of one of the one whom heaven was built to exalt. If the true purpose of heaven is to dwell in the worship and the presence of God, then perhaps we are still in need of a heart adjustment to be prepared to give ourselves completely to him. Our lives today and the choices that we may cultivate a heart that is prepared to worship God. Jonathan Edwards once asked, how can you expect to dwell with God forever if you neglect and forsake him here? And Paul urged the Colossians and their, their believers that since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. You know, in hindsight, we can look back at the life of Peter and see how it played out. And we can see that God still had a lot of work to do in him. Peter would be prepared for heaven by experiencing his capacity to betray and deny Jesus, even to a simple slave girl. Later, Peter would grow in his heart once more when he learned the value of forgiveness as Jesus forgave him. And Peter would grow again when he was entrusted to plant some of the early church. 
In Galatia, Peter would have to confront his beliefs about circumcision, kosher food, eating with Gentiles. Tradition tells us that Peter eventually had to face his fear of death by becoming a martyr for his faith. So perhaps like Peter, you and I have a lengthy journey of preparation before we transition from heaven to earth. As God looks at you and I today, he sees a need to transform our fragile faith into lives that are sanctified in Christ. Each day that we remain on earth, though it pains us, is serving a holy purpose to cultivate true love for the Lord and surrender in our hearts. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul also had this same kind of tension in his heart that his body was breaking down. He would call his body his earthly tent. Paul said this, while we, were, while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we wish to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So we can be encouraged that although Peter and although we yearn to be at home in heaven, Jesus says this in verse 1 of chapter 14, uh, telling them, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He also continues, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. So this is a glorious thought. I love this because there's plenty of room in heaven. And your place is being prepared by the same ingenious creator of heaven and earth who put the stars in the sky, the same creator who invented the rainbow and who spun the cosmos into orbit. Imagine if God created the earth in just seven days. Imagine what he could do with 2,000 years of construction. It'd be a vast understatement to say that great things are being prepared in heaven for you and me. Besides preparing our hearts and besides preparing our rooms, we need to prepare our hope as well. I actually attended a funeral this past week for, for the daughter of, of one of our group leaders and the pastor quoted this exact same verse that I have here about preparing heaven and, and preparing a room. Because it serves as a reminder and a comfort for the loved ones who are left behind. There is a place being prepared for those that we lose and, and are there in heaven. And what a comfort it is to know that they are safely in the hands of God. There is an address with their name on it and which will one day serve as a place for our happy reunion in heaven. But here is the highlight of Jesus' promise to us. We can't overlook this. Someday you also may be where I am. What will you say to your Savior when you stand as close to him as I am to you? What's that interaction going to be when you meet him face to face? How will you react when you realize what he has prepared for you in heaven, and what he has saved you from. Our first principle is this. As God prepares heaven for us, he prepares us for heaven. Every born-again believer lives with this heaven-shaped hole in our chest, a yearning to be home that only God can satisfy. But like Peter, Jesus has more for you and I to do in this life. Charles Spurgeon once said something that is good news to all of us. He said, he who has gone to prepare heaven for us will not leave us without provision for the journey. Truly, the Holy Spirit is the power that fuels our transformation and prepares us for heaven. And while the Spirit of God builds us up internally, the Son of God builds our inheritance at our eternal home, glory by glory until God the Father decides that the project is complete. Go and get your bride. It is the work of the complete trinity to make our home perfect and to make a place for us there. In Revelation chapter 21, this verse will become a reality someday. 
Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. What is God doing to prepare you for that day of living with God? What heartaches are growing you today? What doubts and fears are, is God allowing you to face to refine you and to build you? Are you fighting the growth that God is doing in you? Or are you preparing yourself to become a full citizen of heaven? So now that we've spent some time on the preparations that have been made to establish our home in heaven, let's shift our focus to how we find the way home. How do we do this? Well, in verse 4, after Jesus has spent years of teaching these disciples, he casually says to them, you know the way to the place where I'm going. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Thomas's question highlights the fact that even to Jesus' disciples, our heavenly home is shrouded in mystery. I can think of three giant problems we have in finding our way to heaven. Okay, first of all, we are ignorant about heaven. Is heaven up in the sky? Is it in another dimension? Is it in a different galaxy or a different solar system? How does God elect those who are saved for heaven? Maybe all we can say for certain is that the Father lives there, and that's about it. You see, we are ignorant of heaven and deeply in need of truth. But second of all, here's another problem. We live in mortal bodies that are worthy of death. Heaven is a place for immortality and righteousness. And here we are as sinners. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, and the righteous king of heaven will populate his dominion with nothing but perfectly pure and righteous people. We are a dying race, and heaven is for eternity. The third problem I see is that we are incapable of living out perfect love. Even if we somehow picked the locks of the gates of heaven, and even if God allowed mere mortals through its pearly gates, we don't know how to live there. We don't know how to live in perfection. We have pride. We have insecurity. We have selfish hearts. We are too broken to live the way a citizen of heaven should live. Let me summarize our problems, our three problems in this way. We don't know enough, we aren't alive enough, and we don't know how to love others well enough. These are big problems. But in our inadequacy, Jesus steps in, and he offers us an answer that meets our needs. In verse 6, maybe one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In those two short sentences, Jesus perfectly overcomes those three problems I just mentioned by offering himself as the way home. Yes, we are not great at loving others, and our actions are not suitable for heavenly life, but Jesus has shown us his life as the way that we should live. He gives us his spirit, which transforms our heart and our actions to reflect his life. And in doing so, Jesus' way becomes our way. And then, yes, we are deeply ignorant about the landscape and the reality of heaven as a place. You could fill libraries of books with all the stuff that none of us knows about. But it reveals to us that the only truth that we need is that the cross has the power to save and that our faith is secure in him. Jesus supplies us with the essential truth of heaven because he is the truth. And yes, we are worthy of death, not eternal life, because of our sins. But by grace, Jesus gives us e <clears throat> eternal life with the free gift of salvation. Because Jesus, <clears throat> he paid our debt, and our life is declared righteous before a holy God. We are fully justified in his sight in heaven. Therefore, Jesus' life offers our immortal souls everlasting redemption because Jesus is the life. By Jesus saying that I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, we are given a person as the answer to finding our way home. 
And in case there's any confusion at all about this, he adds a second part. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. As plain as that is to to see and to read, there is a survey that gets taken every two years in the U.S. among people who identify as Christian, and they were asked if they agree or disagree with this statement. It says, only those who trust in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior receive God's free gift of eternal salvation. That seems pretty straightforward. There's no other way. But sadly, 40% of the people polled in 2022 disagreed or somewhat disagreed with that statement. It's puzzling how a statement so plain and straight from Jesus, red letter text, no one comes to the Father except through me. It's still met with so much confusion and so much debate. Our world does not accept this truth because it's inconvenient and it rejects the idea that we can choose our own salvation, even a path that accommodates a lifestyle of sin. But even for those who wholeheartedly agree that Jesus is the way, oftentimes we can still live and walk with Jesus as if that wasn't the case. Too often we speak about our path home to heaven and we talk about our spiritual resume. We talk about our personal effort in following Jesus. Or we talk about our status as a church member. But we must remember that the way is a person. It's not a promotion for good behavior. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. How would you give directions if somebody asked you the way to heaven. And it's one thing to know the way to heaven, but it's another thing to actually believe it and live this out. Maybe you have a great answer for what the way is, but like Philip, you'd like to have some proof that Jesus knows what he's talking about. Philip, with full transparency, asked Jesus for evidence and says, and it says, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. In verse 10, Jesus answers back, Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words I say to you I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. You know, if you today are a hesitant believer like Philip, we can look at the ministry of Christ and get encouragement. We see a person who is healing the blind and making the lame walk. We see somebody who raised Lazarus from the dead. And best of all, Jesus himself has conquered death. And he was resurrected three days in the tomb. The evidence of Jesus' works are unprecedented throughout human history. To quote the blind man who Jesus healed, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Jesus gave us phenomenal evidence that the Father's work was in him. And it's clear proof that he alone knows the way to the Father's house. He alone is the way. So my last principle is this. Jesus' divine authority confirms that he is the only way to our heavenly home. I can't underscore that enough. He is the only way. Jesus did not lie when he said in John 10 that I am the gate. He repeated these I am statements all throughout John as we've read this year, and it highlights the fact that he's connecting himself with Moses who spoke to the great I am in the burning bush. He spoke to the one who boldly proclaims in John's gospel that I am the the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way home to heaven We will try other ways, of course we will, to make a satisfactory home in this world, in this life, or to try to find other ways to heaven. We will probably try. But time and time again, every alternative will lead us back to the truth that he is the only way. Charles Spurgeon once said that hell has many gates, but heaven has just one. You may think you can live very well without Christ, but you cannot afford to die without him. Therefore, your path home to the place where you belong, 
to the place that you were meant to enjoy and the place that you long for every day of your life can only be found in Jesus. So here it is. This is your heavenly home being prepared for you at this very moment. Are you ready to move here? Jesus says to, all, to us all, don't you know me? Do you confidently say that this is, that he, that he is the way? Revelation 21 describes this home, and as we receive this home, and this is great encouragement to me, it says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. In the end, I find that time is short. Our home is near for those who know the way. So let's pray. Lord God, show us the way, Lord. I pray that every man's heart in this room, Lord, would just have a clear picture of the way. Lord, we want to know you. We want to build a relationship with you. We want to receive your truth and your wisdom and just come to the place where we admit that you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life, and we need all those things. Those things are essential to our walk with you, so Lord, I pray that we would receive you into our lives, that we would live for you. We would follow you through every dark corner of our lives and the places where you refine us, the places where you build us up to become citizens of heaven, Lord. Help us to receive those moments and that training in order to become children of God. In Jesus' name, amen.